Right, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, today we have Andrea and Tony from UC Berkeley um, who's going to talk about um, one of our great works on Neil Supernovi from a super Great, thank you. So just to um, remind everybody, oh, this is the problem. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Uh, so stars above about 10 solar masses die when their iron cores collapse under their own self-gravity. And uh, stars between 10 and roughly 30 or so solar masses, as you can see by these star points here, um, they die as red supergiants. And those, these stars are very red, very cool envelopes, and radii of hundreds to a thousand times the radius of the sun. So when iron core collapse leads to a successful sort of canonical supernova of the star, um, of course, barring any circumstellar material, we see that as a type 2p supernova. And these supernovae have this characteristic <coughs> roughly 100 day uh, plateau in their light curve. And this is coming because you've ejected all this hydrogen. Um, hy you have hydrogen uh, recombining from sort of the outside in. And so the hydrogen recombination front is setting a photosphere. You have the photosphere sort of receding in and mass coordinates as this ejecta is expanding. And so you end up with roughly constant luminosity during this phase. And then of course here is just your tail from uh, nuclear uh, decay. Okay. Now core collapse doesn't always lead to one of these successful canonical supernovae of the star. I mean, instead this explosion mechanism can fail. And specifically I'm talking about this sort of turbulence aided neutrino driven supernova explosion mechanism. And what I'm showing you here is a collection of 1D and 3D core collapse simulations uh, where they sort of model the neutron star, they have all the neutrino physics and everything, um, and try to see if this core collapse actually uh, leads to an unbinding and explosion of the stellar model. And so these are 1D simulations for a couple different initial models. Uh, Adam Burroughs' group also uses the Kepler models as their initial conditions. And what you can see plotted here is a function of the initial mass or the zero age main sequence mass of the stars is in green are examples of successful explosions, which generally leave behind neutron stars. And all of the black points are examples of failed explosions where you unavoidably form a black hole from the collapsing core and the inner parts of the star. And most of the remaining star is going to stay bound and try to accrete onto this newly formed black hole. And uh, what you can see is that actually success or failure of these explosions is not monotonic or a single valued function of the initial mass of the star. And in fact, it turns out that success or failure depends quite sensitively on the pre supernova structure, things like uh, steepness of the entropy gradient of the silicon oxygen interface. And folks in the supernova uh, community have done really amazing work and we're starting to make progress on sort of this mapping between initial mass and outcome. But the key takeaway for our purposes today is that basically an unknown fraction of red supergiant explosions actually fail. And so we'd like to know, you know, what happens when one of these explosions fail. Um, and for a long time, it was thought that you wouldn't really, yes? What are the other green lines? Oh yeah, I should have Luca make me a new plot. These were just ones where um, he could predict the outcome based on the other models that he ran, but he didn't actually run the simulation. Yeah, thank you. Um, but there's still successful explosions. He just didn't have to run the whole thing. Okay, so motivated by this fact that um, a reasonable fraction of red supergiants could actually fail to explode and then just collapse, um, Chris Kachanik and others at Ohio State for about 15 years have been just monitoring about a million red supergiants in nearby galaxies and waiting for them to disappear. And their best candidate so far um, is this, in this galaxy N6949, and they named this BH1 because they think it's maybe a black hole birth. And so what you can see is in this Hubble image from 2007, you see the star sitting here in this blue circle. And so they've classified that as a 25 solar mass red supergiant. And then in this later HST image in 2015, uh, in the optical, it seems like that star is no longer there. Okay. So the light curve is interesting. So this is many years of data, uh, 
Most of it is with uh, the large binocular telescope, uh, so in the optical. Um, there's a couple of, of Hubble points, and then these are all sort of spitzer. And what you can see is prior to about late 2008, early 2009, the star is kind of, sort of just marching along at the kind of typical you know, red supergiant luminosity. And then it undergoes this brightening by about a factor of 10 in the optical before dimming by more than five magnitudes in the optical thereafter. And there is this um, you know, still infrared source sitting there at the location. Um, and uh, so we know this was a red supergiant and we know it definitely didn't have a type 2p supernova. And so the question is, was this the birth of a black hole or something else? If this was in fact the birth of a black hole from collapse of a massive star as the Pachanic group um, proposes, uh, we'd like to have a self-consistent theory both to describe this brightening and sort of the late time emission in the infrared. And we, and we don't have that. Um, and so thinking about what happens when you do have one of these stars sort of disappear, and the process of disappearing and after is what motivates um, a lot of the work that I do. I did uh, certainly think I'm writing still radio after the ultraviolet. So there's no X-ray, but if, um, but this material, the the material that was ejected, should be constant thick to X-rays for a very, very, very long time, and so you wouldn't see high any high energy emission. Um, there's a very bright infrared source. And I wasn't going to um, dig too much into it today, but there's been recent JWST observations where they've been able to sort of fit the SED. And it appears that there is a, still a source whose bolometric luminosity is about 10 or 20 percent of the star before this outburst. Um, but what is the source of that luminosity and what is the creating the dust shell around it is we're very far from being able to understand that. Um, but the high energy things we are should it's still content thick, so we wouldn't see those things. Yeah. And there's something in the blue. Ah, very good eyes. Okay, so I think the observers are gonna have a little bit of a spicy argument over the next six months if one of them gets JWST spectra. Uh, because this sort of uh, 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 change in the star right before the event might be one of the ways that we can differentiate between. I'm going to steal my own thunder right now between luminous red novae, which this could be, so a stellar merger, um, or a birth of a black hole. Um, and so I don't think we understand what's happening here. Um, in one case, you expect, uh, you know, changes in the in the light curve before the event, and uh, but I think that blue is is really interesting in this color change. And in fact, one of these JWST groups that argues for the stellar merger case thinks actually that the star was redder than normal right before the event. Um, and they use some of this change in color right before to kind of argue their point. But it's very, very weak and we need more data. Yeah, and modeling actually. Um, okay, so what are the ways that we can generate a transient following a failed supernova? One of the ways that we know of is what I'll call mass ejection from neutrino cooling. And so the idea here is that uh, when the core collapses, you always go through a proto-neutron star phase. So you form this uh, really hot neutron star. It's cooling by copious emission of neutrinos. And so uh, because these neutrinos are carrying away sort of rest mass from the core, you actually have a change in the rest mass of a core of 10% to you know 30%, uh, sorry, a tenth to a third of a solar mass of material in about a second. And so the envelope of the star doesn't know yet that the core collapsed because that can only that information only propagates out sort of on a sand crossing time or shock crossing time. Uh, but the envelope knows instantaneously that now the gravitational potential has changed because you reduce you reduce the mass of the core. And so you can get the sound pulse that forms kind of deeper in the envelope, um, and then it it steepens as it goes down the density gradient, and it can steepen into a shock at the outer layer of the star. And so we know that this is one way that no matter what, you can always eject a little mass um, outside from the surface of the star. And so um, the first, uh, so Elizabeth Lovegrove in 2013 was the first to study this sort of in detail numerically. And she found that for the red supergiants, you can have a brightening uh, with a luminosity of 10 to the 39 to 40 ergs per second for about a year. And here's a light curve that she did from some post-processing of some Kepler models. 
Um, but more recent self-consistent calculations looking at a variety of different mass of stellar progenitors um, have found basically, so for red supergiants, you can eject about a solar mass of material. Um, it depends very sensitively, just like in the supernova case on the pre-supernova structure of the star. Um, but then for the more massive and thus more compact progenitors like yellow supergiants up to wolf Ray stars, uh, you eject much, much less mass, so 10 to the minus two solar masses or 10 to the minus four. But in the end, and this very much depends on the neutron star equation of state actually, uh, for these red supergiants, we expect maybe a one to, a, to three solar masses to stay bound uh, in all of uh, Ivanov's models. Okay, so this is one way that even without any rotation or anything, you can generate a transient. And of course, the other way that we know and love to generate a transient is through accretion. But for, with accretion, we need enough angular momentum to sort of break spherical symmetry and give us a way of converting our inflow into an outflow. And of course, this is famously illustrated by uh, the collapse of rapidly rotating wolf Ray stars, which we think are what produces long DRBs and the associated supernovae. But here, of course, you have a very rapidly rotating core that's able uh, to give you this huge angular momentum support. You form a, a disk you form this relativistic jet that can punch through this very compact star. Uh, but in red supergiants, it's not so easy. So for one thing, um, uh, Lin Hao and Jim have shown that the cores of red supergiants are actually very slowly rotating at the time of core collapse. And so it's typically assumed that you have no way of generating an angular momentum powered transient when a red supergiant collapses in a failed supernova. And so the typical assumption then is that you form, you know, this black hole, the inner layers can accrete in, and then this big hydrogen envelope of this red supergiant can just fall in radially. And because you have no angular momentum, you have no way of generating an outflow. And then this also um, leads to the expectation that when you form black holes in these failed supernovae, that the black hole mass is actually the total mass of the star at the time of collapse. Okay. But it turns out you actually don't need any rotation because the envelopes of these red supergiants are fully convective. And the random uh, velocity field in the convective envelope actually carries a lot of angular momentum. And that sounds kind of weird. I mean, the star is not rotating. It has no net angular momentum. Uh, but locally in each shell, because of this velocity field, um, it carries non-zero momentum. And so I, can, I think the cartoon picture is the most intuitive way to think about this, is that before collapse, you have this envelope that, you know, if we put Betelgeuse in our solar system, it would extend past the radius of Jupiter. Um, so you have this material with this incredibly large moment arm. Uh, you have convective velocities of, of let's say, uh, convective Mach numbers of about 10%, okay? And so before collapse, all of this material already has these huge fluid motions. So then the core collapses, you take the rug out, you know, you pull out the pressure support and this material starts falling in. But instead of following these kind of perfectly radial trajectories, everything kind of follows the path trying to conserve the specific angular momentum, well, the total angular momentum that it started with. And so this kind of uh, break from spherical infall then uh, creates these opportunities for collisions. This material is falling in very supersonically. You have these strong shocks and all of this can help uh, tap the potential energy of the material falling in and help you turn this inflow into an outflow. Now, of course, uh, this is only dynamically important if the specific angular momentum of these parcels is bigger than the specific angular momentum you need to circularize outside the innermost stable circular orbit of the black hole. There's, there's the R in tape here. I'm assuming everyone knows what the ISCO is. <laughs> Um, okay, but said another way, I really like to work in terms of circularization radius. This is important if the circularization radius of the material is bigger than the radius of the ISCO. And so the circularization radius is just the circular orbit, the Keplerian orbit the parcel would have given that specific angular momentum. Okay, and I guess another intuitive way to say this is circularization radius is a weird thing to think about. If I have a parcel coming in, um, the, it's going to settle into that orbit, you know, dictated by that radius, um, if you can get rid of its eccentricity, I guess we should say. Okay, 
Okay, so I'm going to carry forward here now an important result um, from Quadrat, Laquanet, and Coughlin, where they studied this effect of the convective uh, envelope, so the convection in one scale height of material. And so they simulated a slab uh, in just plain parallel geometry at one scale height, tall, by many scale heights in sort of, you know, length and width. Um, and what they found is, is that you can quantify the specific angular momentum associated with the convection uh, roughly by a formula like this, where the specific angular momentum is proportional to the local convective velocity in that slab and the local scale height. And so they came up with this local estimate. And so what we wanted to know is if um, you actually simulate this in the spherical geometry of the star, does this equation hold? And most critically, then, what happens when you actually try to collapse this material onto the black hole? What does this accretion flow look like? And what I should say is I just took for granted that this formula was correct enough to believe their conclusion that this effect is only important in the hydrogen envelope of red and yellow supergiants. And the helium layer, which is also convective, and there's other convective layers going in, there the specific angular momentum is orders of magnitude too small for this effect to be important. So I just carry forward the assumption that the real problem that we want is what happens when the hydrogen envelope tries to accrete on the black hole that includes everything out to and including the helium layer, okay? So I just assume that inner, inner stuff is going to be able to successfully and quiescently accrete. Ah, um, so basically what you're doing is counting the number of eddies that you have in a shell. And so you're saying, what's the volume of an eddy divided by the volume of the shell? And it happens that all the R's cancel out. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There, there were R's down here, but there was also an R up here in terms of the, the scale. It's not that it's the no, this is just, this is kind of the, the average that you would expect in for the mean in that shell. And basically they kind of guesstimated their way to this. And then with Daniel's um, spectral simulations, found that this one half was about the appropriate scaling to the local simulation. Yeah. It's actually really quite cute because you can write it down. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this, um, I call this the local estimate, and it only works locally. Um, what I find in my simulations um, actually is that the convection um, covers many, many scale heights. And so we know from observations actually in Betelgeuse that these convective eddies occupy a huge volume of the envelope, maybe a quarter of the volume of the star. And so you actually can't use this local estimate. You're right, in like a MESA model or whatever, um, BC and H are both changing as a function of radius. Um, and it so, turns out that this breaks down when you actually consider the full convective flow. It's a key assumption of any size Yes, oh. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So in here, the assumption is that the eddy volume is like an H cubed. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, so what I did then was said, okay, well, let me simulate the convective envelope of a red supergiant and measure this effect and then actually collapse it and see what happens to the accretion flow. And so step one is setting up this initial condition of uh, steady state convection in the hydrogen envelope. And so what I do is I model the um, hydrogen layer. So these are just hydrodynamic simulations. And so I model the uh, hydrogen envelope as a polytrope. I, I represent that sort of helium layer and everything interior as just the smooth potential of the origin. And then uh, to generate convection, I put in a constant heating rate at the center. This represents the, lumino the stellar luminosity. And then I have a cooling function to mimic the photosphere at the surface. And so I just turn on this you know, burner, whatever, my little Bunsen burner and my star. Um, and I run this for about 600 dynamical times until I get to uh, thermal equilibrium. And so this is just showing you what I'm defining as thermal equilibrium is that um, uh, the time averaged cooling rate is equal to my heating rate, which is already a constant. I've set that. And then if I look at the 
uh, convective luminosity, so the energy per time being carried by the turbulent flow, is roughly independent of radius, and it's roughly equal to my heating rate and my cooling rate. Okay. And so this movie is after this thermal equilibrium is established. So you, I, you're, I didn't show you the transient stuff in the beginning while this is setting up. Okay, now once I'm in thermal equilibrium, um, then if I look at the um, convective Mach number profiles of this envelope, um, I reproduce the convective Mach number profiles of this MESA model very well. And so these red supergiants, uh, their envelopes are pretty similar across many different masses. And so basically I can uh, scale this simulation to many different red supergiants uh, just by you know, putting in the right uh, numbers in my dimensionless units, if that makes sense. So this applies to, to many red supergiants. Okay, so that's all fine. I mean, all the work is setting up this turbulent initial condition, but then we wanna measure uh, the angular momentum. Okay, and I wanna start just in code units just to convince you that you can have zero total angular momentum, even though locally you have angular momentum that the black hole is gonna care about. And so what I'm showing you is, these are cumulative profiles from the center of the star out of the X, Y, and Z components of angular momentum. And so what I do is like, let's just focus on this black line. So I start at zero and I'm just summing up, adding up J, Y in each shell of my star until I get well out past my star. And so what you can see here is that, and, oh, and each line is just a different instantaneous snapshot of the star, and these are the three components. So if we focus on here, so as I start integrating here from the center, I'm integrating over shells mostly with negative JY, but then this curve turns back around as I start integrating shells with positive JY and vice versa. And so basically, once I get outside of the star, all those JYs have uh, canceled because I have no net angular momentum in this in this star. But locally, because of this turbulent and random flow and this sort of finite volume in each shell, um, I, I'm not zero at every radius in the star, only when I integrate out in total. And so, and, oh, and this is just the magnitude of the vector. So if I take the magnitude of those three components of the vector, so you have All right, Andrew. going down to zero, yes. All right. Yeah, what is the y direction in this setup? I'm sorry? What is the y direction in this setup? It doesn't matter. So there's no uh, symmetry axis. So these are in Cartesian coordinates. And actually, if I show you different uh, instantation, in, uh, different uh, times, it might be a different component that looks like that. So it's completely random. Okay, so it's just a coincidence that you have negative angular momentum in the y direction in this profile. Sorry. It doesn't matter because see here at this time I have negative JZ and positive okay. JY. It's totally okay. random. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Okay. So so that's that. But what we actually want to do is put this in astrophysical units so we know what's going to happen or try to predict what's going to happen. Okay. Oh, were there any questions in the last thing? That plot is a little confusing. Yeah. Uh, any size is what? Uh, no, this is the size of my star. Sorry, this is code units. My photosphere is about here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, out here? Yeah. This is because I'm running a dynamical problem on a thermal time in a finite size box. And so I end up with some material leaving the domain. And because I started with identically zero angular momentum in the box, that's carrying away angular momentum, so I end up with non-zero left, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it's very small compared to what's in each shell, which is what I'm measuring. Okay. All right. Okay, so now let's put this in physical units. So what I'm plotting you here, this is a space-time diagram where each column in this figure is at fixed time. And I've taken a spherical profile of the specific angular momentum. So this is a profile of specific J, but then I've squared it and divided by GM to put it in terms of circularization radius. And so this is the center of the star and then my photosphere is about here, okay? And so this is um, a chunk of time while I'm in thermal equilibrium. And so I've taken the circularization radius and then I've divided by the radius of the ISCO 
of the black hole that will form from the inner parts of the star. So anything that's significantly greater than one, the material is not going to be able to accrete onto the black hole. It's going to be deflected significantly from spherical infall well outside of the black hole ISCO. Yes. Is, is that just determined by the core mass of the black hole mass? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like a 6 GM over C or C squared. I have this wrong. Is the is the ISCO? Yeah. Yeah. It does depend on spin. So I'm assuming zero spin, but it's a difference of a factor of like a couple. Yeah. Okay. And so the takeaway here, though, is that independent of when this envelope chooses to collapse. Um, this material has many hundreds to a thousand times the radius of the ISCO of the black hole. And so that means that there is just simply no way that the convective hydrogen envelope can fall in spherically and thus quiescently onto this black hole following a failed supernova. Okay. If you were to make the same plot a more colorful with some effective direction of the spin, like how variable would the spin have to change over time? Is it like even the average? Okay, so this is the mean in that in this shell. Okay, and you can see. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, yes, if I did. So if we go back to this plot, this is what you're asking. So this shell at four, you can see that the direction in JZ and Y and X are completely changing. What um, I for, I did calculate, I did periodograms to see what's the characteristic time for that to change, but I don't remember uh, what that number was. Um, I mean, it was certainly bigger than the dynamical time of the ISCO, but also I have finite resolution in my simulation, so I can't simulate smaller scales than that anyway. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's so good. You also go back to the point later and talk about why, whether you would call a transient this quarter. Yeah, so when we met earlier, I also emphasized that um, in addition to the mean, so this is the mean in this shell. I took the numbers off because it's confusing for people, but let's say this is like, you know, 20 R sun. Like what's in this little square right here, this is the mean in that shell at this time. And so that's changing with the function of time. But also in the paper, I plot for you the distribution about the mean in these shells that are about to accrete. Um, and it's very, very wide. And so you also have a very broad distribution of directions of angular momenta in each shell. And so it's really a mess as the stuff is collapsing in and we don't have an easy way to understand what's gonna happen in this flow. And in fact, before we did the collapse calculations, we just assumed, like everyone assumes these things collapse spherically, there must be cancellation, there's all this mixing, this isn't gonna matter once it falls in. Um, but what we showed actually is that the specific J is very conserved um, and the circularization radii that we predict here um, actually ends up being what we realized in the simulations. But so let me show you the, the collapse. Did I see a hand up? Okay. So, all right. So I, I really want to follow and resolve the flows of the circularization radius. Okay. Now if I scale this to like a 16 solar mass or supergiant, that radius in physical units is about a tenth of our sun. Okay, but this simulation, I'm not even showing you the whole box here, it's 5,600 our sun wide. And my smallest grid scale is about a solar radius. But I'm gonna resolve that. So what I do is I take this inner region, put it in a new simulation, and I add like another 10 layers of refinement. So my refinement is going deeper and deeper in increasing by a factor of two, you can kind of see that here. See, I go from this size to that size. Um, and so I did what I call these zoom-in simulations. And here the box now is about 700 R sun, but I picked up better than a thousand uh, in resolution. So I'm able to very well resolve where this material is gonna try to circularize. Okay, and so to um, allow accretion, I basically just, so my smooth potential is still here, kind of representing the black hole, everything up to the helium layer. Then I introduce a sink here where you're just flooring the density and pressures. And so you're taking the rug out and letting everything just free fall in. And so I'm not capturing feedback from the black hole. This is asking what happens as this flow with this random angular momentum is trying to fall in and accrete. And so I just want to show you a qualitative uh, result. So this is a slice through my 3D domain in one of those zoom-in simulations. And what I'm going to plot for you is just all of the outflowing material. 
And so if you care, that just means all the material with a positive Bernoulli parameter. All of the, keep in mind this white background, the star, which all has negative Bernoulli parameter because its bound is falling in. And so this outflow is actually sweeping out through the collapsing star. But I'm not showing you that in the movie, just for clarity. It turns out both, but you're right, you can't assume. <laughs> um, if I show you the movie, it will become obvious, and then I'll show you a plot. Um, I'm showing you the stuff with positive Bernoulli parameter. So locally, it's unbound, including the local gravity. But that doesn't mean it's going to escape the infalling ram pressure of the star. So that's a separate question. Seemingly unbound. Yes. OK. OK. And so basically, um, you know, I turn on accretion. The star is collapsing in. As I showed you, all this material has too much angular momentum to accrete. And so you just start driving this outflow of, of you know, thermal and kinetic energy and mass. Um, and it basically doesn't shut off. Um, and and uh, Ren, so I'm dividing the Bernoulli parameter by the escape speed squared. And so there's a pretty good chance the stuff has you know, 10 times that, that this is actually formally unbound. Um, but we can check that by actually looking at what is the integrated energy of this, including the binding energy of the star. And so that's what I'm going to show you here. OK, so basically this outflow starts and you start monotonically increasing the total energy in this outflow. And again, I want to emphasize I'm including the binding energy of the star out to the surface of the star in this. And so basically, um, you start driving this energetic outflow. And critically, when I cross zero, that is, the star really is effectively unbound. Uh, this energy keeps on accreting, uh, sorry, keeps monotonically increasing. It basically doesn't care that it's unbound because I have these channels because of this stochastic flow where I can keep bringing a tiny little bit of mass down deep into the potential and that material can share its energy with the rest of the outflow. Um, and so I can basically just keep increasing this total energy of this outflow. And now if I extrapolate this total energy out to the time when this shock reaches the surface of the star, what I find is that um, I get an explosion energy of about 10 to the 48 ergs. And I aligned about 90% of the envelope. So in this case, about 10%, 10 solar masses. Um, but because this is a lower energy, I get uh, ejected velocities or shock velocities of a couple hundred kilometers per second. Now, for comparison, in the 2P supernova case, this is 10,000 kilometers per second. So this is a slow moving, lots of mass that's been ejected. OK, so we'll, I'll talk about what the observational signatures are of this in just a second. But first, let's go back to this question of what are the masses of the black holes that are formed when you have a failed supernova? So this is the plot from Chris Kachanik's paper where he took, I think, a bunch of Kepler stellar models and he looked at so as a function of the initial mass of the star, just before core collapse, what was the mass of the iron core? What was the total mass of the star? And then what was the mass interior to the hydrogen envelope? So this is integrating out to and including the healing layer. And so basically for the red supergiants, which remember I told you go up to about here, and you can see that nicely in this plot because the red supergiants are the ones that retain their hydrogen envelope. Um, Basically, if you assume the whole star was able to collapse onto the black hole, you would say that you should have black hole masses between 10 and 15 solar masses. But instead, actually, you eject all but 1% of the hydrogen envelope, and so your final black hole masses are more like 5 to 10, which is really different than what the previous prediction was. OK, so for observational consequences, let me just remind you where we are. So we've had this hydrogen envelope. We've ejected it with 10 to the 48 ergs of kinetic energy. Okay, Just like in a type 2p supernova, you have all of this helium-rich material expanding. As it expands, it cools. You have uh, the gas starts recombining at the, from the outside in. And because those electrons that were free when the gas was hot are your source of opacity, the material becomes optically thin outside of this recombination front. And so just like in a type 2p, it's this recombination front that is sort of setting your photosphere. And so this is going to recede in in mass coordinates, and it's going to set that plateau. Okay? So you have two features of the light curve. One is that accretion, so that outflow that I showed you, that's shocking the star as it's sweeping out. 
you have the breakout of that shock from the surface of the star. Once that shock front has broken out, it's deposited all this energy in the hydrogen envelope, and that's when it's going to start this expanding and cooling. Okay, so there's two parts to the light curve. One is the initial shock breakout. And so Tony Pyro has done these nice calculations where as a function of the explosion energy and the radius of the star that the shock is breaking out from, what is the luminosity of the shock breakout and what is the duration for these green lines? And so we're about this red X here, 10 solar masses of ejecta, about 10 to the 48 Earth explosion, a few hundred solar radius star. And so you have a shock breakout that is a few to 10 days long. Okay, and now for the plateau, I'm gonna do something a little bit kludgy, which is I'm gonna use two piece scalings to estimate the brightness and duration of the plateau. And so um, if I take my explosions from my dimensional simulations, and I scale them to two different MESA models, um, a 16 solar mass red supergiant, an 11 solar mass yellow supergiant, I get these two points. And just for comparison, this is the red supergiant I've been kind of using for comparison all along. So this has a 10 solar mass hydrogen envelope. This yellow supergiant only has about a one and a half solar mass hydrogen envelope. So the ejecta mass is much smaller here. Okay, and so what I find is, is that the luminosity on the plateau is a couple times 10 to the 40 ergs per second. And the duration of uh, the plateau is 200 to about 600 days. Okay, this blue point is that failed, potential failed supernova that I showed you earlier, uh, just for completeness. And so it's a little bit dimmer than this estimate. Um, we still think this could be a stellar merger, but that's a separate talk. Um, but what I really want to point out, though, is these three other points, which are somewhat related. So these are luminous red novae. But they're the class of luminous red novae that are extragalactic, um, and that they have uh, supergiant progenitors. So there is a population of galactic luminous red novae that we think are coming from mergers of lower mass stars, a few solar masses. Um, but there are also these much brighter luminous red novae, still dimmer than regular supernovae, um, that are coming from uh, supergiant stars. So blue, red, yellow supergiants. Okay. And so what you can see is actually these overlap significantly in this parameter space of the uh, uh, luminosity on the plateau and the duration. But also the shock breakout, you have this blue peak of a few to 10 days followed by this, you know, couple hundred days plateau. Um, and so we think actually that some of these luminous red novae that we're observing and that Mirage has carefully populated in his paper uh, from ZTF could actually be the birth of black holes in these failed supernovae. And so um, I'll, I should explain to you actually what a luminous red nova is. And so um, basically these luminous red novae, as I alluded to, are happening in binary systems. And so the idea here is, is that the binary goes through a common envelope. And so you have, this is a star that has now evolved, its envelope has expanded. And so it's expanded so much it's engulfing its companion. And so now this embedded object is experiencing drag forces as it moves through this gas. And so these drag forces take energy out of the orbit and dump it in thermal energy into this envelope. And so two things are happening. The orbit is shrinking, the companion is spiraling in, and I'm sort of puffing up and maybe ejecting this envelope. And the simple math that um, you know, common envelope people do is that if you have enough orbital energy more than the binding energy, the envelope, then maybe this core of the, of the supergiant star and its companion can survive as a much tighter binary. Or if you don't have enough orbital energy, um, then these two actually merge. And whatever energy you dumped in, you can eject some amount of that envelope. Okay. And so the luminous red nova comes from either the merger of these two objects or some accretion happening here, causing an outflow that then shocks and exits this hydrogen layer. And so this is why these luminous red novae have a very similar double peak light curve like I was just talking about for these weak shocks at, uh, you know, exiting the hydrogen envelopes of these stars. And so the, um, the energetics are the same. Uh, the uh, ejecta velocities are hundreds of kilometers per second. Um, the colors are very similar. Um, and so it's really worth doing some more careful modeling to be able to differentiate these two. And I'll just say that this uh, common envelope channel is really important for this in situ formation of LIGO binary black holes and neutron stars. And in situ meaning that this is like, 
I guess I should say isolated binary channel versus what Kyle works on, which is how you make these binaries in, in these dense clusters. As I mentioned, the observables are similar, but what's really important is Rubin is going to see like hundreds to a thousand times more luminous renovae than ZTF. And so um, as we're getting this amazing data and also some of the things that I know you all are finding with Winter and Gatini, um, we'd like to have better models of what these failed supernovae look like um, so we uh, can compare the light curves. And so that's something that I'm doing now in Athena um, with full radiation transport and I've added the hydrogen equation of state is to be able to generate light curves of these weak explosions and be able to say something about the unbound mass, the bound mass, and of course this observational signature. So that's ongoing work. I'm just showing you the shock breakout for some different energies, so stay tuned. But I want to come back in a couple of minutes. Yeah, this is the shock breakout, and then this will be the plateau. And I'm not showing you the end because I'm still working on that part. It's, there's a tricky thing with the inner boundary in order to show you the whole plateau. Yes. So in your failed supernova simulations, the like deposited energy is that you just um, project that yourself in your or does it come from? No, there's no way to do this self consistently at this point. So I'm just ejecting the energy. And, and there's is it supposed to represent? It represents like from the black from accretion of the black hole or it can. So okay. I want to actually do many scenarios. And so the two parameters that I'm going to adjust is the energy deposited, but also the time over which you deposit the energy. Because in the way of driven things and also in these failed supernovae, I mean, you saw that I was feeding, I forget how to show, oh, here it is. Um, you can see that it takes uh, 30 days even to get to this point where I've gotten to, you know, 10 to the 47 Earths of energy, I actually think it takes about a dynamical time of the star to sort of deposit all the energy. And so the explosion like E dot is very different than the instantaneous explosion of, a, of 10 to the 48 Earths. So I actually want to do all of these things. And so to represent a range of things from pre-supernova outbursts to, you know, the shock breakout in these common envelopes, and then also just the plain vanilla range of shock energies and deposition time scales for the red supergiants and it can represent a whole broad class of these things. And so what's more important is what is the ejected mass, what is the role of hydrogen recombination, and what is the light curve as the function of the energy that you deposit without necessarily having to be self-consistent with the particular uh, model. Yeah. Okay, so I think I just have like two more minutes or something. 15 minutes for questions, I don't know. Questions? Okay, so I just want to come back now um, from away from the light curves and just um, talking. Oh, I forgot I have this plot here. I need to go back. Um, okay, so this explosion energy that I estimated is probably a lower limit for a few reasons. One is, is since I had to excise the inner part of the star, I actually couldn't simulate all the way until the shock got to the surface of the star. And I actually think it could take one or even two dynamical times of the star to shut off the accretion. And so therefore, by estimating the explosion energy at the time the shock reached the surface, I'm kind of like truncating my integral artificially. So you could have higher energy just because the accretion is ongoing. Um, but the other really important thing is that I didn't have magnetic fields. And so magnetic fields, of course, are a very important source of viscosity that could allow this material to shed some of its angular momentum and circularize yet deeper in the potential well of this black hole, and thus increase the budget of energy that you could put into driving this outflow. Um, and then, of course, I didn't include the black hole feedback, but I won't talk about that now. So why are magnetic fields important? Well, we know they're important in red supergiants because when we measure the surface dipole field of Betelgeuse and Antares, we see that there's about a one Gauss field. And so if I just assume that is the same <coughs> field that's in the interior, I assume flux freezing, assume the materials in free fall, then I can ask, when does the magnetic energy density equal the uh, sort of energy density of the sort of infilling ram pressure of the material trying to fall in? And so I find that the magnetic field is very dynamically important at about a tenth of a solar radius, which is about the circularization radius that I had in my previous simulations. So magnetic fields are going to be just as important at about the same radius or same time as the angular momentum. Now, we really have no idea what the interior fields of these stars are. 
And so another estimate I can make is say, well, what if I'm kind of in equal partition with the turbulent uh, energy density, turbulent kinetic energy density? Well, then you'd assume a hundreds of gas field, but maybe it's tangled, it's not dipole, we don't really know. So the strategy I took to include magnetic fields in these simulations is I, is I took my star in a box that I had before, um, but at the very beginning, when I first initialized the flow, I seed some magnetic field of some geometry. And I did, this happens to be a poloidal field that falls off with the density. I also did rings, I did a dipole field. All of these things turn out not to matter. Once I get into steady state, I basically end up with the same field strength and the same field geometry, which is this tangled small scale field. I don't have a movie, sorry. It requires a lot of snapshots and a lot of memory, and I haven't done those yet. Okay. But I'll just show you uh, in the minute that I have just a couple of numbers, which maybe Elias is the only one who cares about this. <laughs> is um, This is the uh, uh, theta. So this is the ratio of the thermal pressure to the magnetic pressure. And so this is about 1,000, you know, hundreds to 1,000. Um, but then the turbulent uh, uh, pressure is a few times the magnetic pressure. So in both of these measures, the hydrodynamics of this turbulence is still dominating. And that's why you just end up with this tangled small scale field that's just being dragged along with the flow. Oh. Because you made the assumption that if you had some sort of the line thing, it would have to act within the simulation of the plane, right? Oh, that's true. Yes. Like you're in a stronger field like the outcome makes. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right, you're right, yeah. Okay. Um, ah, but I am constrained because I know if I had this huge dipole field, I know I have a limit of one gauss on the outside because that matches observations. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. And so the key question is in the zoom in simulations, what do I need to resolve? And so here I'm just showing you that. So basically, the circularization radius that I get of this material, so the angular momentum that I get, even when I include the magnetic fields, is very similar. And so it's about the same order that I had to resolve before. And so if I assume that the magnetic field grows as R to the minus some power alpha as the material flows in, you know, flux freezing gives you alpha of two. Um, what I actually find, because you have reconnections happening, you're able to thermalize some of that flow, is actually that power is about 1.8. And so, and so that means that I still need to resolve down to these radii where I can get any of the Radii where uh, magnetic fields become important, but also where the angular momentum becomes important. And so that's what I'm doing now. Um, and I won't talk about why that's important unless you ask me. Um, and so I will just leave it here, which is that um, we know magnetic fields are important. We know some of these other things are important. It could be that we end up with yet higher explosion energies. And so just stay tuned. And that's all I have. Yeah. Okay. So there's another axis, right, which is you want to compare to the straight no V versus the phase uh, capital velocities. And the velocities that we've seen in entire samples of the straight no V is 2,000 thousand per second, whereas in the phase of the no V is a few hundred thousand per second. Right? There's a factor of 10 there, which is hard to reconcile in this picture of the straight no V giving you the I should, yes, I should say though that the, okay, so the movie that I showed you was pretty spherical outflow, and so there I have, you know, 200 kilometers a second, but when I increase the resolution and decrease the sort of softening length on the potential that I use to like simulate this flow, and I increase the resolution of this inflow, I actually get more um, asphericity, and so I end up with a blob moving at a thousand kilometers per second, and then the rest kind of moving at a couple hundred. Um, and so I definitely think I'm like not converged here. Um, and so, so what we see is the bulk flow, right? Hmm? What we see is the bulk integrated flow. Yes, yes, yes. So it doesn't matter if our pockets are moving. I mean, it's like a pretty big blob. Like if we were looking at it from that direction, I think that would dominate the bulk motion that we saw. Yeah. Velocity is, I would say, it's going to be yeah, yeah, yeah. And also with the with okay with the merger candidates, 
you would see multiple velocity components because of how non spheric our fluid is, right? So in like different lines, you might see this few thousand kilometers per second, and in other lines, you see a few hundred. Which we don't have. Okay. It's just basically the non -spheric. Okay. So okay. That's that to me is always being okay. Okay. Yeah. And unfortunately, with um, the failed supernova candidate and other ones um, that are less sort of promising, is that they have photometry but no spectra, and so we don't know what the velocities are. Um, and actually, so for example, like Barrage in your sample of the um, intermediate luminosity transients and the luminous red novae, like how many of those are there spectra where you actually know the velocity? All of them. Yes. All of them. Okay. Okay. Yes, spectra. Okay. So for those we know. Uh, yeah, the other thing we also see in these luminous red novae is almost all of them show some signs of interaction with surroundings and also yeah. in a high resolution yeah. spectra, we see like this sort of absorption line yeah. like of the coming. And do you think that uh, do you think that could also be a differentiator? I don't I mean not really because we think there. most two Ps have circumstellar yeah. material too, right? Yeah. yeah. But I but probably, yeah. So if I mean like if I see what the energy is in these MHD simulations, if it's quite similar, then that could mean that um, you know we're not seeing these, and so maybe there aren't failed supernovae. I think that would mean that the supernova explosion mechanism is more robust than maybe what we get from simulations. Which I mean, if you talk to Adam Burroughs, everything explodes. Um, but <laughs> how that happens, you know, we're not sure about. And so it could be that these are yet more energetic, and so these are the you know lower luminosity things that have very little nipple. Um, yeah. Is there any difference in the velocities of the galaxy and the extra galactic luminous red I think that would be a, a question yeah. for them because I haven't looked a lot at the galactic ones. I think that's where I'm seeing the lower velocities. Yeah. So most order are different than the mass of the stars. So lower mass. Generally, I mean, like observation is there. So, yeah, yeah. so the galactic ones they generally Yeah, so so many orders of magnitude, right, in terms of the mass, like what you call the velocity of that. So, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so it's really it was the way of thought here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the galactic ones are like here. Trying to understand the question of what's the meaning of energy in this other interaction with the waves of the stars. Yes, this, yeah, what I think I was saying. Yeah, but now we will basically present the version of this question when that uh, energy is spread over time. Yes. That makes the interaction of the material harder. I think it's harder because if I slow down the rate at which I'm injecting energy, I have a weaker shock. That is true. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. 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 I mean, it might be. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I kind of assume that, you know, if you want to deposit that outgoing sort of shock energy over, over the material that you're sweeping through, you want as strong of a shock as possible. But I guess, I think you go from a shock to a wind, right? So maybe the L dot going out um, changes, even if the total L, integrated total L doesn't change, right? So you go from, a wind to an outburst to an explosion. That would be my intuition, but I think Tamar would be able to tell us what happens with the Mach number. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's harder. It's also harder to simulate the lower um, injected energy rate. Um, and I think so. If I remember in Itai's paper, they were specifically thinking about the pre-supernova outbursts. Um, and right, the waves, I mean, they deposit this energy over something like the dynamical time of the star. It's not 
instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of the astrophysical system that it, we're trying to model, I think that time is much longer than that. Um, and yeah, the question is, is whether that helps you or hurt you. I think the stars, especially in this convective envelope, can kind of efficiently thermalize that material if the rate of heating is too small. And then you get like your red supergiants where they kind of puff up, but nothing, I mean, I think that's interesting. You know, definitely astrosigmology people think that's interesting, right? It's going to change things. Um, but then the star can kind of thermally adjust. Um, Comment. I mean, I think what I really love about these predictions is that this is something we can test in the next few years if mm -hmm. ATM is good with how big the current is. Yeah. The shock breakout is something that requires the high heat and the ATM, and yeah. that low luminosity plateau was was very well suited to do that. Yeah. So for events that are jointly detected in these facilities, that if they, if they exist, I think we should see them large numbers, yeah. right? Because they should not be a small number. I mean, they could be because, like, how maybe a lot of red supergiants lose their envelopes, right? So if the if the rate of red supergiants having um, failed explosions is small, um, then it could be a very small fraction compared to the luminous red nova rate, I guess. Um, I mean, one thing though is so actually the real reason why I'm doing the weak explosion simulations is. I mean, I'm getting the light curves, which is cool, but I actually really care about the fallback accretion. And so in the sort of late time, um, so, you know, you eject this material, it starts off really cold because the explosion energy is really low. And so you um, form dust very quickly. Um, and kind of almost everyone in Monsi's group knows that these events are self-obscuring by dust and are happening in preferentially dusty environments. And so I think the other thing is to understand what the fallback accretion looks like. Um, in order to understand, so like I mentioned, we have these JWST observations of that failed supernova candidate, and we don't really understand the fallback accretion flow, so we don't really know what this 20% luminosity source is. And so that actually is why I'm doing all the hard work of using an Eulerian code to do these explosions instead of a Lagrangian code, is because I actually want the temperature and luminosity of the fallback material to then think about you know, what's actually happening with the black hole accretion flow, and then how is that luminosity being reprocessed by the stuff that's already been ejected. Um, so that, so I think the fallback accretion is like the other, aside from the velocities, yeah. yeah my question is actually closely related to that. So uh, mm -hmm. can you directly Um, not in these simulations. Uh, what I want to do is, um, so uh, so when I do the zoom-in simulation, this is kind of actually step two in my mind, um, because once I have the zoom-in simulation, I can actually, I'm starting to overlap with what's possible to simulate in um, GRMHD simulations, because I can get down to like a few hundred RG in my highest resolution of these. And so um, what I actually plan to do during postdoc is um, with the MHD simulations is I'll have this self-consistently made sort of inflow. And the plan is with Sean Ressler, who's at CETA, is we're going to follow this flow to the horizon and actually see if we can see like the disk form. Because you can't understand you're going to have a disk and a jet. And, um, and so that, I don't want to become a GRMHD expert. I just, I'm interested in this one accretion problem. And so Sean and I are going to collaborate on this to do step three, which is then following this um, sort of these ab initio initial conditions down to see what happens with the disk formation and what kind of outflows you form. Oh, the other very simple question oh. is with MHD, uh, is the density scaling with radius and the current scaling with radius almost? I haven't looked at it, but the convective Mach numbers are the same, so I think they're very similar. Yeah, the convective Mach number profile is very similar. Yeah. One and a half to two. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I actually don't know what the accretion flow. Yeah, I don't know what that scaling is. Yeah, so for the typical accretion, for the radiatively inefficient accretion flows, you get the M dot goes as R to some power between a half to one. And so I, I don't know, like I haven't simulated down enough that I get a straight power law. 
Like it's very time variable. I don't think I've simulated down to small enough radii yet to really like be able to answer that question. Yeah. Because right now I'm just dominated by the initial density profile of the of this flow. I'm not down to this like sort of steady state flow part. Yeah, that I have to zoom in a lot more. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think we're at the hour, so let's think. Right.